Good afternoon, class, and welcome to Chapter 8 of um, the Logic and Critical Thinking text, Thinking Socratically. And Chapter 8 is titled Standards of Inductive Reasoning. And this is one of my favorite chapters in this textbook. Um, but with the difficulty of a favorite chapter is that you want to uh, focus on particular things, and yet all of the uh, articles uh, all of the readings are really good, and I would um, definitely read all the articles, even though for this chapter I want to only focus on um, two articles and one question from each article. But all of the all, all of the articles are great. The first one has to do uh, with an earlier election, and what I mean by earlier election is um, let me get there real quick. Um, the um, election between Landon and Roosevelt, in which it was predicted that Landon would win, and um, on the contrary, Roosevelt won, and um, it calls into consideration how they are uh, getting their sample sizes to determine election results. It has quite a bit of relevance um, in, in contemporary times. I would definitely um, um, recommend reading that. Uh, one of the uh, articles we will focus on, and the one that the page is on right now, is by Malcolm Gladwell. Uh, and this is a fantastic article um, uh, called What Pitbulls Can Teach Us About Profiling. And the other article we will focus on is by um, Hilary Putnam. And that's the last article. And that will be um, in Renewing philosophy. And, and again, that's just a fantastic article. Um, the point there has to um, be, be pondered quite a bit. Another article that we won't focus on has is called, uh, So Smoking Causes Cancer, This is News. And um, it has to do with the difficulty of making causal claims going from a correlation to causality. Uh, this chapter in particularly uh, we'll focus on three things, um, all forms of inductive reasoning. They will be uh, generalizations, analogies, and causal claims. And just philosophically and critically, we're going to look at the difficulty of um, actually making those claims. And um, so for the first article, let me go to the uh, questions page. And so the first study question I want you to do after reading uh, this article by Gladwell, I do question one, what arguments does Gladwell use to defend um, pit bulls from their stereotypes? Critically evaluate these arguments. I know a few of you have missed assignments for this particular week. If you want to get some extra credit, uh, 20 points, you may also do question two and question three. Question one is assigned question two and three can be done for extra credit. Um, so when answering question one, I want you to, uh, I want to draw your attention to these paragraphs in 203. Um, what does he mean by a categorical problem? And, and so um, reflect on that, be able to include that in your answer. And also he, he um, presents this, uh, interesting aspect of the uh, um, uh, categorization or categorical problem. Um, yeah, category problem. Um, in this sentence here um, about uh, a generalization, about a generalization, um, and then in particularly um, a, a generalization about a generalization about a trait that is not in fact general. So that's essentially what um, an aspect of the category problem uh, defined as the category problem. As you read this article, be able to present that in the answer uh, to your first question.
right? So it will, it will involve a category problem. And then with the latter two questions, if you decide to do those, um, also be able to comment on that. Uh, for the latter question, uh, so, so question one for this article is assigned, and then if we're going to skip to um, the last article, and it's going to be study question two. So we're not going to do any exercise questions this time. We'll just do study question two. Why would Putnam or any person or computer believe that Uku entering, enters Emerson Hall then Uku um, will no longer be able to speak Inuit. Uh, what better entrenched beliefs conflict with this belief? What is the evidence for each of these conflicting beliefs? Uh, so let me give a bit of background on this particular uh, story. Um, oh, wait, so we're in the wrong one. Okay, so here it begins. Um, so Harvard Hall, um, or Har Emerson Hall, is where the philosophy department is in um, in Harvard, and Putnam is setting up a particular example of the problem of induction. And so induction again is the idea that the uh, future will resemble the past. And we've already in the previous chapter understood that that takes a bit of generalization because every particular future is somewhat unique. But when we make the generalizations, we do essentially suggest to ourselves that the uniqueness is not particularly relevant for the generalization we're gonna make. And we do this an amazing amount of times, and this is something that Putnam wants to point out. So. Um, uh, Uku is um, an Eskimo who is speaking Inuit, and he is about to walk into uh, Emerson Hall. And so um, Putnam points out in this experiment, philosophical thought experiment, that no one has ever uh, spoken Inuit in um, Harvard Hall. And so in one sense, given just inductive reasoning, we're not sure if this um, will be able to work. And so he foresees two possibilities. One is that um, um, Uku will continue to be able to uh, speak Inuit once entering um, Emerson Hall. And the other possibility is that somehow he will not be able to uh, uh, speak Inuit um, when he uh, enters Harvard Hall. And so common sense tells us obviously that he'll be able to, but again, the, the interesting thing about common sense and critical thinking is when everyone sort of thinks it is one possibility, we don't necessarily think critically about why. And so we might not have a good answer as to why we just somehow know that he'll be he'll continue to be able to speak the language in, in, uh, in Emerson Hall, even though no one's ever done it before. And this is the odd thing about inductive reasoning. Uh, we, we generalize that the future will be like the past, um, even when a particular type of future scenario has never come into being. So he asks, uh, Putnam asks, although we know that he'll still be able to speak and you while entering uh, how are we justifying this idea how is our mind working such that um, that um, we we know this and so obviously we do but then think of another task for example think about uh, programming a computer to sort of know the same knowledge as the human being would know in this situation and it's unclear how we would be able to program a computer to sort of make that generalization, to sort of know, for example, or to be able to predict, of course, he'd still be able to speak the language as opposed to not being able to speak it, even though inductively speaking, 
that situation um, has never come up before. And so this is just one of many situations. For question, study question two, you might think of your own um, philosophical uh, thought experiment situation. There's, uh, there's endless amounts of situations like this where we make a generalization about which one is possible and which option is not possible, even though we've never encountered it. Um, so for example, uh, in a similar sense, um, while driving in my car, there's only ever been three passengers. There's never been four passengers in my car. So hypothetically, philosophically, it could be the case that uh, four passengers cannot be in my car. And when a fourth passenger got in my car, one would disappear. Now we know that's not true either, but inductively speaking, how do we know that? Because that past has never been. We're not sure what that future will bring. Now, again, this sounds very silly, but what about our reasoning uh, makes this silly? We're making generalizations about things that haven't really come into being in particular situations. How are we separating out the particular from the general and applying a general rule? to particular futures. This is the philosophically interesting thing about question two, uh, which I hope you um, enjoy answering. Um, so I'll just read it really quick. Why would Putnam or any person or computer believe that if Uku enters Emerson Hall, then Uku will no longer be able to speak anyway? Uh, what better entrenched beliefs conflict with this belief? What is the evidence for each of the conflicting beliefs? So uh, I hope you enjoy answering that question as well as question one in the uh, former, um, uh, former article. All right, I hope this helps um, and I uh, look forward to reading your responses and let me know if you have any questions either through email or Canvas. Thank you.